just gone six. People will probably keep trickling in a little bit afterwards, but shall we get going? Gail, mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to give it a go, see if you can start off? I'm going to try without my video camera on. Um, I'll briefly turn it on so you can see who I am. <laughs> but it's awful tonight, so uh, I'm going to keep my camera off. And my colleagues are going to do more of the talking. So I'm Gail Chapman. I'm the public programs officer. I usually do quite a, a, a little bit of an intro, but I'm going to hand over we have a long bottom, Larry Jones, our senior curator, Liz Dagger, and our three stars of the show. Joe um, Ray. Um, and I, before I make you all start complaining about how broken up my voice is, <laughs> Liz, who's going to give you Thank you, Gail. Um, so for, her, for anyone who isn't familiar with New Row or hasn't been to any of our events before, this is just a bit of digital housekeeping. So all of our participants, your cameras and microphones will be switched off for the duration. This is to save our bandwidth. Um, only the presenters will be visible to you throughout. However, if you would like to ask questions, please pop it in the chat. Um, this is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So if you have any questions for our speakers, um, if you put it in there, we will address them if we have time at the end. Um, other things to tell you about is there is an option to maximise your screen. Um, this is in the top toolbar. And if you want to come out of that, just press escape. Similarly, you can make your participant list disappear by clicking the cross. And then in your toolbar at the top, you can press playlist if you wish them to come back again. If you have any other technical difficulties, I will be managing the chat. So just pop it in there and I will do my best to assist. OK, I'm going to pass you over to our senior curator, Larry Jones. Great. So thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. Um, like Liz says, if you have any issues with anything at any point, just put a message in the chat and we'll try and help you out with that. So I'm really glad that you've decided to you know, log in and listen to us this evening. Um, this is the last of this year's RCP Museum's Digital Museum Lates, um, titled Narratives of the Heart. And we're joined by Sophie Layton, Dr. Joe Ray and Dr. Giovanna Biglino. I'm, you know, it's such a pity that we can't actually welcome you into the building, but, you know, I hope we'll be able to give you a sense of it and sort of show you a bit about the exhibition. And this is a really lovely chance to um, talk to our three collaborators and they can tell you a bit more about their work. So I think it's going to be really interesting. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Royal College of Physicians, the RCP is a medical charity. It represents about 38,000 doctors worldwide. Um, our core mission is to improve patient health and reduce illness, sort of in a very broad way. There's lots of different elements of work involved with that. But as well as being a modern healthcare charity, we're obviously, because you're here tonight, you've seen that we have a museum. Um, we also have a 500 year history, so it's a really old organisation. This history is looked after by the library, archive and museum teams. Um, and we care, excuse me, we care for a huge range of different collections. So we've got everything from rare books to artworks, medical instruments, silverware, letters, manuscripts, most of the things that you could think of. Um, and these cover the history of the RCP itself, but also really broadly the history of medicine. And we also have a lot of artwork as well. So in you know, more normal times, all of this is available for research and it's displayed around our building in Regent's Park in London. Um, and it's also used in our active exhibition and events programme. So um, Gail or one of us whose internet is holding up will tell you a little bit more about this at the end of the event. But we have a new exhibition launching in January. So stay tuned for a bit more about that. That will be a digital one because of the continued difficulties. Um, and we've got, a, you know, got more events to tell you about as well. If you enjoy today, then please do consider donating to us because we're, a, you know, we're a small museum and a charity. So two things that have been quite hard hit in the recent 
you know, recent strange times. And, you know, your donations do allow us to carry putting on these sort of free events and, you know, anything you can give really does make a difference. So tonight, this event is part of our programme for the current exhibition, which you can find online if you haven't already. And the exhibition is Under the Skin, Anatomy, Art and Identity. And it looks at how anatomical art represents the body, how the techniques have been developed to show this, you know, to represent the 3D body in two dimensional ways. And it also considers the power that is implicit in representing the body, you know, whose bodies are used, who controls how they are depicted. Um, we've been really lucky to work with a broad range of contemporary artists on this exhibition and their work has you know, let us look at different ways of how the body has been represented. Um, and sorry, I got a bit tongue tied there. So one of these artists is Sophie and I'm you know, really pleased to be able to have her here tonight along with her collaborators, Joe and Giovanni. And I think with that, that's enough for me and I'm gonna hand over to Sophie. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, well, it's it was a real privilege to have uh, work in the Under the Skin exhibition. And um, I thought I would just give you a little bit of a background to my practice, but very much also uh, it gives me an opportunity to um, work with Giovanni and Joe and just to look at how as an artist, the work is interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary and what that affords um, within the sort of medical landscape. Um, so just to sort of start, now I've got to make sure I get my clicker in the right place. Um, in about 2012, my background is very much as a participant art artist who creates work with people and um, I work in a sort of installation practice. So I create environments uh, often with sound um, and a lot of those conversations and art pieces come from working with people and their own sort of narratives. In 2012, I did an installation um, at Evelina Children's Hospital, and that developed out of a year long uh, process of working at the bedside on a project called Bedside Manners. And the idea was to work with parents rather than the children and to explore the conversations of the parent looking after their child within um, the medical context and particularly. Uh, there were a lot of people that had re repeat sort of visits to hospitals. So they had um, kidney disease and so they were on di dialysis or they had quite long term illnesses. Mm. And what I realised from doing this piece of work was that it was really important to try and. Although the piece was really successful and it met its objectives of working with parents and children and finding a different narrative within that landscape, my work was sort of marginalised as uh, some people would consider it sort of art therapy or it would be something that you did with the, the parents and the patients, but it, you weren't considering the whole sort of medical landscape. And I was lucky enough then to apply for a Wellcome Trust Small Arts Award. And out of that, I was given the opportunity to go and start doing a piece of work at Great Ormond Street, which was called Under the Microscope. Um, Under the Microscope sort of very much started, it was around rare disease but and the conversations around disease, but it was also about looking at how, and as an artist, I could work with... Um, the researchers and the clinicians and bring them into the conversation of making the artwork. And I met Giovanni and I met Joe and we started looking at how as a how I could begin to sort of work with their young people with congenital heart disease and how I could sort of find my way into the the, the practice around that. Um, one of the things that I found extraordinary was this opportunity to that Giovanni and he'll introduce his work and his practice in a little while. Giovanni 
was able to show me um, what it's like to see and to hold your heart. And that for me was an extraordinary moment. And that sort of began to um, very much fashion the way that the whole project developed. As we set up a sort of workshop process working with young people um, and we created sort of self-portraits, um, both in clay and then also I worked with clinicians and explored like a body mapping exercise with different metaphors and narratives around um, the individual and the uniqueness of the individual. And, and particularly what we were doing within this piece of work was looking at of the significance of the heart and how people respond to and um, think about their heart and how that changed if you were working with somebody with um, a, a congenital heart condition as opposed to an artist or clinician who had an understanding obviously of the heart but also but also had a very different relationship with the heart so the the sort of my work at Great Ormond Street was um, very much, it's, it's, it began exploring these sort of conversations and then later became the piece of work, um, The Heart of the Matter, which I'll go on to talk about with Joe and Giovanni. For me, the ability to work in this way and to work with clinicians and scientists gave a very a much more or dynamic and rich interface with 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 my practice with the patients and the participants and i it sort of has changed my whole practice and work so that within the workshop we explore these body mapping exercises i would ask people to explore different sort of metaphors around um, colour. Um, if if you were an animal, what animal would you be? If you were a vegetable, what vegetable would you be? And then the young people sort of created these body maps that they took those narratives and turned them into an imagery uh, and an image making, which sort of filled the whole um, outline. Um, and I think both Joe and Giovanni will testify that what was really interesting about that is that we discovered that, that young people had a very clear understanding of their own um, medical conditions. And through working through an art practice, they were able to n navigate and sort of explain their condition in a very different way. Um, and that, and some of the metaphors that came out of those workshops and, and through working actually on the ward at Great Ormond Street were quite extraordinary. So I was working with a, a mother with a young child who had quite a complicated heart condition known as hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And she, I gave her a 3D printed heart that Giovanni had created and she held it in her hands and she said, I feel like I'm holding snow in my hands. I also worked with um, a, a process called embossing where people were able to emboss a heart and then to create this, this big sort of narrative panel that collected all of these different images together uh, and, and narratives together. So over this process, I began to sort of build a, sort of a metaphorical language around the heart that we explored. Um, so this piece of work sort of initially was part of under the microscope at Great Ormond Street. And we sort of, I worked with Giovanni on creating this um, medical table of 3D printed hearts, but also changed the scale of the heart. So in the piece, you see a bronze heart that's sort of suspended inside a bell jar. And that was also about exploring the preciousness of the heart and the scale of the heart and the weight of the heart. So this became part of the sort of narrative journey that we went on. What was really extraordinary was that uh, halfway through my residency at Great Ormond Street, Giovanni said to me, Sophie, we need to turn this into um, a project. And I sort of, 
And we'd been working particularly with a, a young man with quite a complex heart condition. And the young man had said to me and to Giovanni in, in a what sort of very small workshop, if I said, if I was going to make your heart for you, what would your heart look like? And he said, well, my heart's really complicated. It's a sort of patchwork and a puzzle that can't quite be put back together again. And it's like a Rubik's cube. And I sort of had, it was one of those amazing eureka moments. And I remember emailing Giovanni and saying, oh my goodness, there's something really amazing about this. And Giovanni, sort of, and I said, and it feels like the heart of the matter is that we are not just our medical condition. We are also an individual and, and it's the uniqueness of the individual and the metaphors that the individual describes themselves as that is the, at the essence of this project. And in response to that, Giovanni said, yes, and now we've got to do a much bigger project. And I was like, but I don't know what the work is, Giovanni. And he said, yeah, but I'm a scientist. And when you have a good idea, then you have to look for funding for it. And it was like, oh, as an artist, I sort of work out what I've got to do. And then I look for money. And he said, no, 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 we, do, we, we work in a very different way. And it was so actually to be in dialogue and with Joe, we started sort of developing the heart of the matter and put in a large Welcome Trust award to Welcome, which then seeded, um, or seeded it paid for this extraordinary project that we did for two years between 2000. We started in 2016 and we actually culminated in 2018 of this big national touring exhibition that started at Great Ormond Street and in London. But we then went to Newcastle and went to Bristol and worked with people in all of those different places. Um, and, and as an artist, what I was really interested in was allowing an audience that wouldn't normally sort of engage with the heart in this way to get an understanding of this extraordinary landscape and these extraordinary conversations that we've been having around this work. Um, and part of the work and the piece that we wish we showed at um, uh, has been on display as part of the Under the Skin exhibition is this piece that we call The Bud. And the bud came out of a workshop with um, participants, but a, it was a lot of the people talked about this collective narrative of uh, of the heart being like a sort of a bud or a tree. And through a process of looking at medical imagery and exploring different ways of representing this, I and Giovanni was showing me this beautiful image of the heart with the um, aorta and the kidneys coming off it. And I said, well, that for me feels like it is the bud and it's the seed and it's this internal landscape that we don't normally see. Um, and I'm actually going to pass over to Giovanni here if he's happy to take over to just to explore what this image is, how it was created and what your feeling is about that this is a piece of artwork that sat in the exhibition. Sure, thank you Sophie and uh, good evening everyone. Um, thank you to the Royal College for hosting us also and for having hosted the artwork, Sophie's artwork in the exhibition. Um, it's difficult to start, uh, I wouldn't know where to start, I could start from many different points. I will tell you a little bit about the bud um, and where it comes from. I am a biomedical engineer and now I've been working on modeling the heart in different ways, including with computers and 3D printing for about 10 years. And um, it was looking at these models that was the beginning of the work with Sophia really. And not just the models, but where the models come from. So the models come from images and patients as part of their checkups and as part of their journey, as part of their uh, the process of diagnosing their heart condition, their hearts are imaged with different techniques. And we acquire images and we acquire movies of their hearts. Now, what we can do today is to process these images and render them in three dimensions 
both in the computer, but also to print them in three dimensions, which is not only a very fascinating process, but it's something that is very valuable on different levels. So as part of the research that not just myself, but a whole team of engineers was doing and is doing at Great Ormond Street, and now also I work at the Bristol Heart Institute and in other centers, is the idea of exploring how these models can be used. They can be used to practice an operation. They can be used to teach cardiovascular anatomy. There's many different uses. And something that Joe and myself started already exploring was, can we use these models in the clinical encounter? Can we use these models to improve the communicative processes between patients, parents, and clinicians? And once we met with Sophie, we realized actually we can take this a step further we can use these models with patients. We can explore them with them creatively even. And that not only is very interesting in itself in the moment when it happens, but it's also very useful for us, for our research, in the sense that um, it offers the opportunity to have conversations that otherwise we probably wouldn't have. And in a way that we probably still wouldn't have it because it's held in a different way and it takes place in a, in, a, in a different space than the hospital. And that is incredibly valuable. And that for me was really interesting in the sense of, I have to say, honestly understanding for the first time genuinely what it means to involve patients in research, um, which was enlightening. In terms of the our work itself, uh, Sophie and I um, worked together on looking at images and it was, again, for me, a really interesting process to work with Sophie and to see how much she wanted to understand about the medicine and the science behind it. She has been scanned in the MRI. We have looked at her images together. We've printed her heart. So for me, it was a way to really explore together how we can use these tools effectively uh, as, in a very different way, not to make models for a study, not to um, make something that can be used to have a conversation with a patient, but something else. And, um, and so we looked at different images together and we produced this 3D printed model. So we recreated the shape of a, what you see here. It's the heart, it's some vessels, it's uh, the kidneys and the, what you see running uh, vertically is the aorta. So the main, the largest blood vessel in our body. And um, we printed it uh, hollow uh, through uh, a process that allows us to print one layer at a time, a complex object. And this was done in collaboration with the Royal College of Art, uh, where they have really fantastic facilities for 3D printing. And then Sophie took it a step further, and I will let her describe her choices, but it was really interesting to see how then this model and some of the models that she showed earlier as part of other installations were actually the same models that we used in studies with patients. So it was interesting to see how they became something else effectively, uh, which was really, really interesting. Um, from my perspective, I have to say that working in this way has completely changed the way in which I see potentially my role and of researchers like myself in using technology. I always saw technology as a tool and not an end. So I, as an engineer, I don't get excited by um, the making of the model, but it's what you can do with the model, how you can help um, a patient, how you can help a clinician, but to explore it in such a different way and explore it creatively uh, has really opened a lot of doors. And something that I will mention in terms of the interdisciplinarity before passing back to Sophie is that this work um, for me stemmed from research and that I was doing, but also fed back into research. So we started working on articles that were written in a different way that I would have 
um, done before. We started thinking about different projects and I did importantly start to involve patients in the research that we do with Joe, that we do with Sophie and that I do with clinical colleagues at the Bristol Heart Institute now. Um, but it all really happened because of the encounters that we had during the project that Sophie told you about and the ideas that stemmed from not only from being involved in the process, but also I have to say from seeing the final exhibition. And I remember when, aside from the surprise and the beauty and, and, and the wonder of seeing it all coming together, it was really the sense of that being the beginning of something, not just being the end of a big project that we all loved working on. And that is still very much feeding back into my research. So if there is one thing that I want to highlight is the sense of the research feeding back into this work, but also this work inspiring more research, which is something that I think is uh, really, really important and really valuable. And I hand back to Sophie. I think you might be on mute, Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, Sophie. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you, you me now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I, for me as well, Giovanni, it's completely changed my practice, this project, and it also has meant that I decided to go on to do a PhD and l look at how I navigate this in a, in a sort of different way so it's it, it and I think it's really important to also see the artist and the artist's process not in everybody's case but in a lot of people's case as a, as a research process in its own right whereas people sort of think there isn't a rigor to art but there has to be a rigor and there has to be a respect for the environment that you're working in um, I was going to show a film but I'm aware that we're going on so I'm going to skip that and just give you a little bit more insight into so this is the bud in the exhibition it was 3d printed in a clear resin which enabled it to be lit and because it was then put inside soil the soil became part of a biosphere so the the, the piece um it was like it was alive and it the moisture would drip and uh so it was very interesting when it was situated at the, at the Royal College of Physicians that because the piece had never been up for more than six weeks per exhibition and the Royal College of Physicians, um, your uh, installation went on a lot longer. It's like the, we, we learned about the fact that the 3D modelling couldn't withstand that sort of length of exhibition and it started to bend. So even within the way that you work as an artist is you're constantly working out what your material forms are and your different things like that. And in the background here, we have a series of blueprints and the blueprints are of, again, taking the, the line that is created from the 3D modeling, but trend or the, or the model, the STL file, putting it into a drawing package, a Rhino modeling package, reversing it out and turning it into a line drawing so i literally created a series of blueprints of some of the participants hearts that became part of the sort of landscape of the heart that we were creating and what was lovely is that we could also then give the outline of that work to a participant so in this case she drew her own sort of metaphors around the heart and created a poem which I later sort of screen printed but you can see that her heart model on my right and uh, on the left you see the sort of outline dra drawing in blue that was her sort of filling in of the gaps and then you've got her medical language but also within my heart i see the depths of the sea corals jellyfish curling seaweed a kelp forest the whole world colorful flowing and alive i see movement the beauty of its workings and a deep sea landscape so it's this sort of pulling of of people's metaphors and narratives and then i hold it within the artwork Another piece that came out of this process, and this is a 3D printed house, um, and again, referring back to the 
bronze heart that you saw in the first piece is this locket. And uh, one young person said that my um, her family was like, for her, her heart was about that sort of connection to her family and she, the, 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 she, they were held, she, her heart was held and suspended within the sort of family unit. And so I sort of represented that as an open heart and like a locket that we keep our family pictures inside. And then we 3D printed a house and then it was lit underneath and created this sort of home is where the heart is sort of image. Also within my work, I've again taken the language. And I think it's really interesting that when you spend a lot of time in hospital and when patients spend a lot of time in hospital, they become very comfortable with the medical terminology. So you talk about your hypoplastic left heart, you talk about all of these technical terms that most people wouldn't know, but when it's your reality, that becomes your landscape. So I, I sort of created artworks that actually use that as part of the sort of the world that people have to traverse. Um, and and so then this piece is, is actually printed onto silk and it's printed onto Dupion silk. So it's got two tones to it, like that's two colours of the heart. And then it's um, the outline is created in velvet. So it's actually in relief and it gives uh, this sort of shimmering quality to it. Going back to the, um, the piece that started the whole project was this idea of the uh, Rubik's Cube and the complication of the heart. And... Uh, again, working with Giovanni, I and then I also worked with a 3D modeler. We took this young person's heart and then sort of began to explore how it morphs into um, a Rubik's Cube. And so this was the sort of first iteration of the Rubik's Cube heart. And then the second iteration literally was a kinetic sculpture that would turn and it had a motor in it. And what was really interesting about it it was we timed it so that it it wouldn't ever quite meet up and there was a slight clunking sound and i i'm sure joe can explain the sort of terminology behind that but i think that the young person had a is it an icu valve mechanical heart like, valve yeah and so and actually his mother even said that she, when it was all very quiet, she would hear this slight turning or clunking sound. And, and it, so that actually the artwork, even though I didn't intend it to do that, ended up having this sort of resonance as well as it having this sort of imagery. And so that's sort of, I'm sort of really interested in making a piece, an object that is both beautiful and meaningful, but also holds the sort of story and conveys it in the most sort of appropriate way. Um, the, the, one of the other stories, and Joe will come and talk now, is was about a young man describing his heart as he did this fantastic superhero costume and he drew himself inside a giant heart. And I sort of then, we decided to make a giant medical heart but in velvet. And I was originally going to put the, the performer inside it and then realised it didn't work like that. And it needed to be something that stood uh, separately to the performer. And it was the sort of the, the weight of carrying the heart around. Um, Joe, would you like to come in and talk now? I would, I hope. Yep. Yeah. Can you, hopefully this is going to Yes, that's good. I can see you. Okay, so um, hello everybody. Um, my name's Jo Ray and I am a health psychologist and I don't do anything fancy and clever like Sophie and Giovanni. So as a psychologist, I talk and I listen, oh, probably in the other order. And um, I've worked with patients with congenital heart disease for a very long time, um, since the sort of late 80s. And I guess one of the things that sort of became very apparent to me working with children with congenital heart disease was um, was that although the surgery was fantastic for many of them and to all intents and purposes they were out there getting on with their lives, leading a normal life, 
there was actually quite a significant burden that they carried. Um, and that probably most people think that when children with congenital heart disease have their surgery, you know, they're cured and that's it. Well, it isn't like that. And these patients really have lifelong medical follow up. So for the rest of their lives, they will be hospitals we will be part of their lives. They may have other surgical interventions, medications. And so from a psychological point of view, it's a huge amount for them to cope with. And um, I guess one of the things that they talk about a lot is the fact that this is something that other people can't see. It's this hidden hidden defect. And as, as well as the sort of dealing with what that's like, I'm not quite ready for that picture yet. Okay. <laughs> so um, they're also having to kind of deal with a lot of other things. So um, they might have to deal with um, sort of um, exercise tolerance problems, they might have to deal with fatigue, they might have mental health issues. Um, and they're kind of really having to come to terms with what it is that they're living with this heart condition. The heart obviously is a very emotive organ in terms of language, they have the anxiety about their own mortality. And so it goes on. And so the congenital heart disease becomes sort of a part of their identity, as they try and kind of learn to navigate this, this hidden disability. Um, now, obviously, lots of them do live very normal lives, um, at least to the outsider. And I think um, it's it's that kind of contrast, really, between we look at them, we think they're, they're fantastic and they are doing very well in many cases, but they are constantly aware of their heart problem. They can't ever get away from it. Um, now, some of them show huge resilience and, and a real strength in how they come to terms with it. But that's obviously... Um, not the case for everybody. So some of them will be there um, living really great lives, they're, they're appreciating their life, they're showing a lot of resilience, but that's of, often kind of contrasted with those sort of anxiety provoking moments. And I think, so this um, picture that Sophie's got here is, is there was a series of six photos um, and it was in the exhibition, it was presented as six photos. And what was, Quite interesting was that for the patients they felt that these photos were this was the piece that resonated most out of all of the exhibition pieces with how they felt um, and it resonated with their own experiences and they felt that it captured the burden of their condition um, the fact that they were they were never detached from it so the photograph showed um, this young man with this huge heart in different places, so the hospital, which is where he is there, and you can see he's sort of on his own, and, and they felt that that kind of brought out the sense of isolation that they often feel. Um, there was another picture of him in, um, outside the hospital with the ambulances. Can we have the next picture, please, Sophie? Um, um, and then this one in the park, and this idea that everywhere that he went, his heart condition had to go to, and that's what the patients talk about. They're never free of it. It's always there. They always have to think about it. If they're going on holiday, they have to think about it. Will they get their travel insurance? Where will they get the medication? It's always part of their lives. They can't leave it behind. Um, and I think they, uh, the, the fact that this heart was a huge heart also to them sort of signified just what it, what it represented in their lives. Um, the, but it's also the boldness and then the, the richness of the, of the velvet material they felt symbolised the preciousness of it. Um, and then this idea of, you know, um, this is a kind of quite a fun picture, sort of throwing the heart away. So there's that sense of fun, but actually that person needs to keep that heart close and catch it again. So they, don't, they have to protect it and that sense of feeling that they do want to protect it. Um, and I think what they felt, what a lot of the patients said was that the photos made something visible to, to the outside world that was um, normally invisible to us. It's very much part of them, but we don't normally see it. And actually, and I've written down a quote. So, so one of the things we did with the exhibition was we asked people to um, write down on evaluation cards what their feelings were, what, what they noticed, what they felt about the exhibition. And a few people wrote some quite interesting comments about these photos, which I have somewhere. Um, so one of the one of the patients wrote, "We carry it inside us, so it's great to see it outside." And then another one felt um, commented that I feel I have a love hate relationship with it. I can't do what is wrong nor sometimes right, but it means the world to me. Very precious, but resilient too. I can be overprotective. 
So I think as a whole, what the series of photos captures is the everyday life of the, of the young person or the adult with congenital heart disease and their relationship with it. So the, the appointments, the checkups, intertwined with those normal activities. And that's captured really well in this series of photos. Um, the playfulness, but you can't disengage from it. Um, they have to keep it close. They have to keep it safe. And then I think the um, somebody else commented on how the images contrasted activity with stillness and relaxation with the need for vigilance. Again, things that they felt very much um, resonated with them and what it's like to live with a heart condition. And then something else that the patients also commented on was they felt that the accessibility of the images and the story that they tell um, it was the simplicity of something that's actually very complex, but they also felt that it would be helpful to help others understand something of their journey, the sort of the isolation, the, the burden, but also their pride, the huge part it plays in their lives. Um, and then just another quote. Um, so one of the patients said, I think it'll help those of us, it'll help those without a heart condition understand or at least allow them to empathize with those of us who suffer or have one. I think it'll be an eye opener for many people and even help clinicians understand the emotional side better. And I guess what, what this exhibition has really helped people do and is, is to kind of understand in a different way. It's allowed patients to communicate some of their, their real feelings about what it's like to live with a heart condition. It's allowed other people who don't know what that's like to experience it in a different way. Um, and certainly for me as a psychologist, what's been great working with Sophie and Giovanni is finding a way to to commun communicate those things and to kind of make them accessible. So years ago, you know, it would be battling with just straightforward conversations and trying to help people tell their story. Um, and this really um, enables us to do that. So back to you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so I think just to sort of to summarise before we open up to um, sort of the possibility of having questions from the audience, if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask, uh, I'm just going to show you a very quick one minute film, which gives you um, a sense of what the exhibition looked like. Um, and then I'll just quickly summarise um, before the end. The Heart of the Matter is an the exhibition, heart of the matter is an exhibition the that explores the medical, the and, medical metaphorical and, heart. Metaphorical and each of the artwork tells a different story. Throughout the exhibition, through sound, through visuals, we really see the idea of honouring the stories that are at the base of the Heart of the Matter. There's the medical room the room that explores technology, and then the final room which explores the narrative. It's a beautiful reflection on the heart and on the human story that is behind all of this work. Right. So, just to summarise, I think I, it was a, it's, I mean, it's really lovely to have an opportunity to revisit the exhibition and to be in the space with Joe and Giovanni just exploring a tiny bit of what the process and the, the sort of some of the ideas and the trajectory that came out of the, of, of the project. Um, and it's also it was also a real privilege to be able to show even the bud as part of the exhibition at the Royal College of Physicians, um, because it's it allows the work to live on and allows those conversations to continue, and and to honour the patients who so generously gave their shared their stories and shared their ideas with us. Um, so, and I think that this sort of interdisciplinary work, there's a lot of talk around it. And as an artist, you're sometimes brought in to sort of make somebody's work more accessible or a bit sexy. But actually, when it really works, when you have this sort of crossover of different 
practices, really listening and really trying to learn from each other, for something quite extraordinary happens. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, and I, what I haven't even said is this isn't all my work. It was a huge, team of artists and people that came together the animation you saw in that short clip there were two animations an amazing animator babis alexardis who worked on it you know there was a huge team stephen king as an artist who created the photographs so it's all of that this team and it's the, the medical team behind it and the patients that it's that sort of coming together that creates something quite unique and special and as an artist on my own i can't do any of that it's it's all of our energies coming together so yes if anybody's got any questions or any thoughts it'd be lovely to hear from you um but thank you very much for having the opportunity to sort of let us share our story with you Great. Thank you, Sophie, Giovanni and Joe. Um, that is really interesting. And um, to set the scene a little bit in terms of our exhibition a bit. So um, the budge was in our treating the body section. Um, and as you talked about, this is uh, this element reflect. So this case, this section exhibition reflected sort of how obviously the body has been treated over time, but also how different ways of representing that and the reason we were really thrilled to have Sophie's work in was because obviously most of the exhibition looking at anatomical illustration is different ways of representing the body in a 2D plane. So different sort of printing techniques and illustrations, whereas this is 3D. This is actually people holding their own hearts, which is something that I want to ask you about if we get a chance. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was really fascinating. It was a really brilliant addition to our exhibition. So. Uh, we're going to take questions now. Um, you can address them to particular people if you like. I'm here if you want to ask anything about the RCT exhibition or about the museum. Um, but yeah, if you stick, anyone who's got any questions, please put them in the chat and I will pick them up and pass them to the relevant people. There's um, a question from Anna about sound. Um, and you sort of said, I'm really interested in the way you incorporate sound within your pieces. How would you say sound impacts? your art pieces I myself am also experimenting with sound within my art practice and Annie you've also mentioned that you have a heart condition so this really resonates with you um, I suppose for me there is this sort of narrative and storytelling is a very sort of a key component of the work and so within like the first piece I showed you Bedside Manners that was a sound piece where I and I work a lot with a, a composer Jules Maxwell who created the sound for the animation um when you're particularly when you're in a hospital and you are hearing people's stories but you're also hearing sounds of the machines, the experience of the MMR, MRI um, or the ultrasound machine. So all of these sounds become part of that sort of landscape. And it felt that to hold this, these stories, it needed to sort of also echo that. Um, and the sound from the animation was much more a response to, um, and it's, that's a whole other piece that we didn't even have time to start exploring. That is about 4D flow and the movement of blood around the, the body. And so that sort of, the sound for that was quite a different sort of piece that was illustrating the animation rather than it being sort of, the narrative and the sort of sound. So I don't know if that helps, Anna, but um, that was what, um, that's just part of what I'm exploring with sound. Uh, I, and I think there's something really interesting with this sort of, even the fact that ultrasound, uh, the image comes from something that works as a sound. Is an ultrasound, like looking at Giovanni frowning at me, um, the ultrasound, that creates its images through a sort of uh, the, the, the resonant, the sound resonance and the, the way it reflects on the on different organs within the body. I think what's really interesting is also that there's so many dimensions to the heart as an organ, 
you know, there's, there's the anatomy, there's the sound, there's movement in the heart, there's blood flowing. So all of that um, makes it such that it can be explored in so many different ways. And similarly to the bad uh, that we discussed about in the context of the exhibition, it can be explored in, again on many different levels. Sophie mentioned about her interest about the language uh, and it's the language that we use to discuss the anatomy, but also when we talked about the heart, we talk about the arterial tree, we talk about branches, we talk about roots. So there's all the kind of language that you can see that way. You can see it on another level, more metaphorical. You can link it with metaphors that have been used in the past about trees and flowers that have been used artistically in like Leonardo, Botticelli, many that have used these images to discuss the heart. So what I find really fascinating is also that all these different dimensions and levels in which you can enter and explore um, the heart as an organ and the piece that presents the heart in a certain way. So I think that's really interesting and sound is absolutely integral to not only that the the background, but to the heart itself. The murmurs of the heart are used to diagnose heart disease. So it's it's such an integral integral dimension to the heart. Thank you. Joe, you put your Oh, I'll unmute you, sorry. Okay. okay. Um, just wanted to add one other bit about one of the soundscapes, which was about a mother talking about her child who was on a on an artificial heart, and it was on a continuous leap. And and so, it, as well as what she was actually saying, what it conveyed was that this went on and on, and every day was not like the next day and the day before, and conveyed that in a in a. It was very simple, but it was very clever. The just the the sameness of. And, and how difficult it is sometimes for families who may be in for months and months who where each day is the same. Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, there's, okay, there's Daphne, is it Ka Catherine? Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I don't think we've had any more questions at the moment. Um, I can ask one then. Um, I think Sophie definitely mentioned that you had your heart imaged and printed, I think. I don't know if the others of you do, but can you just talk a bit about what that is actually like, holding a copy of your own heart? Because I, I really want one now that you've talked about that. It sounds like <laughs> it's like such an interesting experience. Um, well, <coughs> excuse me. My reason for doing it was that I felt I needed to understand what the process was, but also what the patient experience of seeing your own heart must be like. And do, so I um, had an MRI done and Giovanni printed this and it was quite a strange moment. And he gave me this sort of cardboard box and in this cardboard box, was what this quite enormous thing is there. It's like it was about, you know, about this sort of big. And I'm like, what, that fits in there? And it, it is quite an extraordinary feeling. And it's a very, it, 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 this sort of making something that you, you feel your heart and you feel your heart when you run or, and you're aware of its presence, but not most of the time, but some of the time. And then suddenly to actually to be able to hold it and to feel the sort of scale of it was quite, it is, it's quite extraordinary and very, um, I found it quite a sort of spiritual doesn't, isn't quite the right word, but it's that sort of quite an extraordinary experience and very mesmerizing and quite humbling. Um, and I've actually now gone on to use that heart imagery in a number of different ways. I've created sort of artworks out of it, but I've also um, sort of we've taken the line of it and it's sort of sort of done a lot of work. And it feels like now that I have a, a sort of a legacy of this piece of work, which I can sort of work with. Um, and then the other thing that we played with was, I've actually got it here because it's like a paperweight. Um, this little bronze heart was one of the first things I made in response to the process. And again, being able to pass something that's very precious and small around has a extraordinary intimacy and delicacy to it. So 
yeah, it's a very, it's a very precious thing. Great. Thank you. I think actually, Sophie, there, that's a perfect segue for a question that came up in the chat from Peter mm -hmm. about collaborative relationship that leads to new ideas for research. So picking up on the point of viewing the heart is something that we were discussing and Joe may want to jump in into this, but we, we did discuss it with our team when we were doing the project, when we did the heart model for Sophie and for all the participants. And we felt that that was something really interesting to explore further. So at the moment, I mean, not at the moment, we had to suspend because of COVID, but we started doing a study that we designed together with a patient where we wanted really to unpack the moment of when patients see their heart models, what, what are the feelings that are evoked? What might be considerations that we want to take into account from the point of view of showing these models to them? So many different levels again. And it was uh, an idea for a study that completely stemmed from this project. So, uh, Joe and I worked with a, a patient to design interview questions, explore the methodology, and we started running the study. As I said, then it's suspended, but the idea is then also to go on and carry out the analysis with the patient. So not only something that it's very interesting from a patient involvement point of view, but it's really a study that completely emerged from uh, from this work. And um, and on other research levels, again, I can give examples in terms of even exploring from my perspective of a biomedical engineer, how other technologies can be used. And from the point of view of, again, whether it's communication or whether it's experiencing. So for example, virtual reality is another tool that we haven't explored in this project, but that we discussed together again as a team as something that um, might be very interesting to explore with patients and with clinicians, in fact, and the general public. And a third level is also research that goes into the analysis of the impact of the work itself. So that's another really interesting level. What is the impact of viewing this kind of work on different audiences and in different contexts? So if we show, let's say, the photographs that Joe were discussing in the um, entrance of a hospital as they were displayed at Great Ormond Street, what kind of impact is do we get from that? Whereas if someone without a heart condition sees those in an exhibition, that's there's another dynamic going on. And so and and also how do we do that? How what are these are not studies that personally I'm used to running and was Joel's has more experience. It's again it led to thinking about new research that, again, it's very intertwined with then the work that we want, we had developed and we want to continue to develop with Sophie. So there's, I would say, not only lots of ideas, but also ideas at different levels. I don't know, Joe, if you want to say about the evaluation, maybe, but... I, mean, I, just, I just think it's extraordinarily powerful. Um, mm patients a voice in a completely different way I think as you as Giovanni just said about the patient co-researcher everybody talks about it but what does it actually mean and I think um, what what we've managed to do and what we've learned through the exhibition is how important it is to have patients at, I mean at the heart of all of this is a terrible pun but sorry about that but it's true um, and it does give them a way of um, kind of expressing and communicating in a way that we haven't had before so you know as a psychologist it's been very difficult sometimes to kind of see patients struggle to to kind of express their story or explain to other people what it's like and I think this work has really given all of that um uh, you know it's really shown us how we can do that and how we can develop it and I think the evaluation part is really important we're not very good at necessarily capturing the impact of this kind of work but I th and I think the, the impact goes far beyond probably anything that we imagine, just if listening to some of the comments that we've had from patients and also people, you know, the general public who have a much greater understanding and connect with it in a way that you couldn't do in, in our kind of more traditional ways of doing research. So um, I think we've got a lot more. It's very exciting, really, what, what possibilities there are for us in the future and for engaging with people in all sorts of walks of life. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm just aware we're getting quite close to time. We've had one of a question. Yes, it's a very important to question. To really quickly. So Victoria says, do you think the distinction you made between therapy and research matters or is it a question of perspective? 
or the point at which you connect with the work? So if someone in question. Facebook. Um, <laughs> it's, the, it's a big question. Um, I think it's really important that it can have a therapeutic output and it works with the patients but if it's if, if it's only seen as therapy then it i don't think the clinicians and the scientists and the wider public see the value of the work so i think it's important that it's seen as a research tool and as a an artistic creative output that uh, that creates a different perspective I don't know, Joe or Giovanni, want to add to that. I, and I would just say, from the patient's point of view, I think if they thought it was therapy, there would be many people who wouldn't want to engage with it. But they get the therapy, you know, huge benefits from participating and being part of it. But I, I think it would be very, you know, yes, I do think there's a there's a definite distinction, and it's important that we keep that distinction. Yeah, and about what Victoria says in her question, the point at which you connect. I think for me personally, so I'm not generalizing here, but the fact that what an artist like Sophie brings by creating something that it not only integrates so many elements, whether it's the sounds, whether it's the models, whether it's all the things that we discussed very briefly, it takes it to a different level. So when I, even being so familiar with all the work, when I entered the exhibition, it was something else and something else happens in that space. So for me, in terms of the, the, the point at which you connect, you connect with those stories, those forms, those sounds in a different way by virtue of being in that space of the installation or in front of a certain artwork for me. And I think I've heard that, again, we haven't, quantitatively and systematically measure that but I have heard it informally from other people and I and I that's why also I'm really interested in exploring it further because it's I think it has a lot of value on many levels it's not that we have necessarily to reconduct everything to quote-unquote an intervention but there there is something really magical that happens I think in that moment great great thank you thank you all of you um, I think we're gonna, we've just gone seven, so we're gonna need to wrap it up there. Gail, can you stick up our final slide, please? So thank you very much to Sophie, Giovanni and Joe, and thank you all of you who've joined us tonight. It's really great to see you here. Um, if you would consider donating so we can run more of these events, the link is here or at the start of the chat from earlier. Um, you can see under the skin, Ars Natum, Art, Anatomy and Identity, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, you can see it online at the link there, which is the RCP Museum website. Um, we also have a really exciting new online exhibition going up from the 18th of January called RCP Unseen. And this is hidden and sort of previously untold stories and unseen objects from the museum collections that um, all of our staff have selected during lockdown. So we've been researching different stories, pulling out some of our favourite objects that we've never been able to show people before, and they'll all be online for you to have a look at. Um, we will also be running an audience selection um, poll, um, yes, that's the right word, um, in the week before that, so I think the week of the 13th or something of January, so the bit after Christmas when everyone goes back to work. If you keep an eye on our Twitter, you'll be able to select which object you would like to see in our exhibition out of a There'll be a sort of tournament of a few for you to pick between. Um, and we also have the launch of the new exhibition on the 20th of January. So we'll be doing another event like this where we have um, different members of staff talking about some of their favourite themes or favourite objects and why they've selected them. So um, that will be a chance for anyone who joins to ask any of the museum and archive and library team anything you've ever wanted to know about museums, archives and libraries and the exhibition. So I hope we, you will join us for that. And you know, thank you again to our three collaborators and to you all for joining us. And I hope you all have a really lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye.